Hello, uh, my name is Peter Rowe. I'm the professor of pediatrics at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore. And for the last 20 to 25 years, we've been working on the issues of orthostatic intolerance and chronic fatigue, uh, especially in the Ehlers-Danlos population. So today I want to talk about the basics of understanding what we mean by these uh, issues in orthostatic intolerance and some practical suggestions about treatment. I don't have any uh, relationships to disclose. Uh, we will be talking about some of the medications that are used in an off-label way. Uh, and for those who want more detail on this, we've done some other webinars for the uh, EDS Society, a longer one in uh, December of last year, and some of the EDS Echoes. And then there's an older uh, webinar done with Dr. Satish Raj, uh, that's available on YouTube if people want to look at that. So we think that uh, autonomic symptoms and orthostatic intolerance in EDS are among the most treatable problems in uh, for, for patients with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And one of the better papers that summarized all of these symptoms was done by Inga de Vondelé from Belgium, published in 2014. And as you can see on the right-hand slide, she's comparing Ehlers-Danlos patients with the hypermobile type with uh, healthy controls on a, an autonomic symptom questionnaire. And so the first column is for orthostatic intolerance. And you can see very clearly how much more prevalent this is in the Ehlers-Danlos population than in healthy people. On the left slide is the comparison of hypermobile versus classical EDS. And you can see that the classical patients also have a fairly high prevalence of autonomic symptoms, uh, less uh, with regard to um, gastrointestinal and other autonomic symptoms than the, the hypermobile type patients. So taking a step backwards, when we talk about orthostatic intolerance, orthostatic just means upright. And this term of intolerance doesn't mean that people can't be upright, but it refers to a group of clinical conditions where symptoms worsen when people are in a quiet upright posture, which can include either sitting or prolonged standing. And symptoms improve, but aren't abolished when you lie down. And an important caveat there is that lightheadedness tends to improve very rapidly when you lie flat, but you can have persistence of orthostatic fatigue and orthostatic brain fog. Uh, uh, so they, those don't necessarily stop once you lie down. The big challenge when we stand up is that about 500 to 750 milliliters of blood pools in the lower half of the body. Uh, this is a, a diagram from Philip Lowe's clinical autonomic uh, textbook showing uh, dilation of the veins in the legs the diagram isn't as good for showing the amount of blood that pools in the abdominal cavity, but a fair amount does. Uh, and as a result, you've got less blood coming back to the heart and less to pump up to the brain. The normal response to this is for the heart rate to increase by about 10 or 20 beats and for blood vessels in the legs to constrict to push that blood back up to the chest and the brain. If that doesn't happen appropriately, you get these symptoms of orthostatic intolerance, and I'm going to split them into two categories. The first is the column on the left that are likely due to reduced cerebral or brain blood flow. So that includes lightheadedness, syncope or fainting, uh, diminished concentration, headache, blurring of the vision, and in all forms of orthostatic intolerance, there is an increased rate of fatigue and exercise intolerance. The, on the right-hand side of the slide are the symptoms that are likely due, at least in part, to higher levels of catecholamines. And by catecholamines, I mean either adrenaline or noradrenaline, or uh, if you're in the US, epinephrine and norepinephrine. There can be a shortness of breath or dyspnea with upright posture. Uh, the chest pain is common as are palpitations and tremulousness. Anxiety will be dealt with by others in the conference, but it is overrepresented in conditions of orthostatic intolerance. And many people have excessive sweating or diaphoresis and can have nausea as well as GI complaints uh, as well. 
So when we're interviewing our patients, especially the adolescents, it's important to ask them uh, a few questions to assess for orthostatic intolerance. One is obviously, have you ever fainted? But because adolescents often don't realize that what they're experiencing is abnormal, we ask them if they feel unwell or lightheaded when they stand for more than five minutes. Occasionally, we'll, we'll, we'll ask them, do you ever get lightheaded? And they'll say no, but I do get a head rush every time I stand. Well, uh, for my purposes, a head rush is the same thing as lightheadedness. Uh, we also ask how they feel in very specific settings that involve quiet upright posture, like waiting in line, going to the shopping mall. And when we're talking with our trainees about this, my comment is that if you're a teenager that cannot uh, tolerate going to the mall, you've probably got a medical problem until proven otherwise. So we look uh, at whether they can stand at a reception in a chorus or a band concert uh, setting or at any kind of religious service. And we ask them how they do in a hot shower. Some of them have to sit down in the shower or, or lie down for 20 minutes after the shower because it creates so much uh, excessive um, orthostatic symptoms. Most of them don't tolerate hot saunas, and some have real difficulty on, in the hot weather of the summertime. Uh, they also tend to compensate for the orthostatic symptoms and not getting enough blood to the brain. So they'll study in a reclining position, so there's less of a rise in pressure required to get blood from the heart to the brain. Uh, and they sit with their knees to their chest or their feet under them as a way of not pooling as much blood in the legs. And many of them will fidget a lot and shift their weight considerably when they're standing. So to diagnose orthostatic intolerance, uh, many people will check what are called orthostatic vital signs, where you measure the heart rate and blood pressure supine, seated, and standing. Most often in medical clinics, this is measured over less than two minutes, and that's really insufficient to identify most forms of chronic orthostatic intolerance. Prolonged testing of at least 10 minutes is usually needed. Uh, and the, one of the forms of uh, uh, prolonged testing is a standing test, and that's usually just 10 minutes after some period of time supine. There are two forms of this. One is the passive standing test where the patient is leaning back against the wall with their back against the wall and their feet sort of six to eight inches away. The other is an active standing test where the person is standing unsupported in the, in the exam room. Uh, with the passive standing test, we have them in our clinic uh, supine for five minutes, checking a blood pressure and a heart rate each minute. And then they stand for 10 to 15 minutes with the feet positioned uh, away from the wall, leaning back. Heart rate and blood pressure are measured each minute. And we also record their symptoms on a zero to 10 scale every one to two minutes. This was uh, introduced as a test back in 1975. And it turns out that it's fairly close to a formal tilt table test for at least the first 10 minutes or so. Uh, the head up tilt table test, which is shown in this slide, uh, it really involves less use of the leg muscles. So uh, it can provoke a little bit more orthostatic tolerance, intolerance than the uh, standing tests. So here the patient is brought on a motorized table up to a 70 degree angle for about 45 minutes. Some institutions will do a second stage. If the patient has tolerated the first 45 minutes upright, the table is brought flat again and then returned to a 70 degree position while there is some, an infusion of isoproteranol, which is another substance like epinephrine and norepinephrine that can uh, mimic some of the stresses of day-to-day -day life. It's intended to drive up heart rate by about 20 minutes and it can induce fainting. When we look at the overall physiology, the factors that go into orthostatic intolerance that seem to be uh, uh, somehow inefficient or defective, uh, these are the, the main categories. That is that these are patients who have a, a problem with excessive pooling of blood in the dependent circulation, probably due to a defect in their ability to vasoconstrict, to tighten those vessels and push the blood back up to the heart. In most of the formal studies where blood volume has been measured, that is the amount of blood in the whole circulation, there is about a 10% or so reduction in the intravascular volume for patients who have 
orthostatic intolerance. We don't understand the full mechanisms for why this occurs, but those two factors, when combined, and the patient is standing or in a tilt test, uh, they combine to cause a reduction in brain blood flow. And in response to that reduction in blood flow to the brain, there's an exaggerated sympathoadrenal response. That is, the sympathetic nervous system uh, increases its out output, uh, and the adrenal gland participates in that. In response, you can get one of the forms of orthostatic intolerance shown at the bottom. The first is orthostatic hypotension. That needs to occur within the first three minutes upright. Delayed orthostatic hypotension is the same uh, uh, has the same appearance, but it occurs beyond, beyond the uh, three-minute point. Neurally mediated hypotension is the term we use for a pattern of drop in heart rate and blood pressure that is caused by a vasovagal reflex. Uh, POTS stands for postural tachycardia syndrome. And then there are a portion of patients who have a normal heart rate and blood pressure response, and we'll come back to that in a second. This is what they look like on standing tests and tilt tests. On the left, you see somebody with POTS who is supine for a few minutes, has a heart rate of about 60 beats per minute, uh, but with standing, leaning back against the wall, develops lightheadedness, fatigue, and even headaches, has a 51 beat increase in their heart rate in association with those symptoms, uh, easily beating the 40 beat increase you need to classify as having POTS in adolescence or the 30 beat increase you need uh, beyond age 19. On the right is the pattern we see with neurally mediated hypertension. This was a medical student at our institution who was having recurrent near fainting in her first year when she was sitting in class in the lecture hall all day. So as she got brought to a 70 degree position, she had lightheadedness, she looked pale, and then very suddenly at the five to six minute point, her blood pressure dropped to below 50 millimeters of mercury and her heart rate dropped at the same time. And that's a classic vasovagal or neurally mediated uh, reflex response. She even had a couple of uh, tonic-clonic movements uh, from the period of abrupt reduction in brain blood flow. Some people talk about POTS as if it's uh, independent of everything else. We find, however, that POTS and neurally mediated hypertension can occur together. So here's somebody who had a 44 beat increase in heart rate in the first 10 minutes of the tilt test, and then at the 20 minute point had the classic vasovagal response of neurally mediated hypertension, all with the reproduction of their typical symptoms. Uh, the good thing is that these two uh, conditions occur along a spectrum, and their treatment is almost identical. One of the other physical features you can see with orthostatic intolerance is this purple, uh, reddish-purple discoloration of the dependent limbs called acrocyanosis. And this is the hand on the left of a girl who had uh, had to withdraw from college because she was so symptomatic. This is her hand after about five minutes upright. Uh, with my hand against hers for a color comparison. And then on the right, you see where I've pressed uh, three fingers into her lower leg to see how quickly the capillary blood flow returns to that area. Uh, it takes a few seconds to step back, get the camera focused and take a picture. So eight seconds or so had elapsed and still she had inadequate return of blood to that area. It should, uh, you should have capillary refill within three seconds. So this is a prominent feature to look for on the examination. Not seen in everybody, but it, when it's present, it's quite dramatic. We've learned a couple of things looking back at our standing tests in clinic. And one is that if you just uh, look at the life table analysis on the left, if you look at the people who have not developed POTS, uh, at the beginning, obviously nobody has developed POTS. So 100% sorry, 100 are without POTS. And these are our, our patients who did develop POTS over 10 minutes. What we were looking at here was how long does it take? How could you do an abbreviated test? Well, if you stop at the five minute point, you're gonna miss about a quarter of the patients who would develop POTS in the last five minutes of the test. And uh, colleagues in the Netherlands, Linda van Kampen and Franz Visser have also shown similar findings in adults with ME-CFS, the, the uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome. So it's important to do the full 10-minute testing. 
Uh, and I'll just go back uh, to point out that for the neurally mediated hypotension patients, you often need a much longer period of time. Usually in our clinic, it's been about a 29 minute point at which uh, the median uh, the, uh, median duration of the tilt test needs to be to demonstrate that. Now, what happens, what does it mean if you have lots of orthostatic symptoms, but the formal tests of heart rate and blood pressure are normal during a passive standing test or a head up tilt table test? You, often people were told uh, that this meant that nothing was wrong. Well, is that correct? Does this mean that nothing is truly wrong with them? Uh, the answer unequivocally is no. And let me show you why. This is, again, work from the Dutch clinic of Van Kampen and Visser, where they took a, a large number of patients who have ME-CFS, 429 individuals. They're all adults. And they compared them to 44 healthy controls. And they had them on the 70-degree tilt test for 30 minutes. And they were able to measure brain blood flow using ultrasound imaging of their in internal carotid artery on each side and the vertebral artery on each side for a few seconds uh, at each vessel so that they could measure brain, the total amount of blood flow going to the brain. And on the graph, you can see that the reduction in cerebral blood flow between supine and the end of their tilt test was about 7% in healthy people. Compare that to all of the ME-CFS patients who had a 26% mean reduction. Now, on the far right, you see those with delayed orthostatic hypertension, and in the green, you see the ones with POTS. They had a 28 or 29% reduction in brain blood flow at the end of the tilt. The people uh, who had a normal heart rate and blood pressure response, and who in the past we might have said were normal, nonetheless had a 24% reduction in brain blood flow. So overall, 90% of the patients with ME-CFS had reductions in cerebral blood flow that were clinically quite uh, substantial and statistically very significant. Moving on to the treatment of orthostatic intolerance, we follow a stepped process. Uh, we try some non-pharmacologic measures, that is measures without medication. We are very focused on treating other contributing conditions. And then we move on to medications, starting with single drug or monotherapy and moving on to combinations of medications that have a rational basis in that you're using each drug for a different mechanism. These are some of the many comorbid conditions that we see with orthostatic intolerance. Uh, I mentioned that we can see this uh, almost universally in patients with ME-CFS. Uh, if you have terrible orthostatic intolerance, you can become depressed as a secondary phenomenon. Some patients with primary depression also feel dizzy, uh, so that this arrow can go in two directions. The same goes for anxiety. We can reproduce uh, panic attacks in the experimental situation using isoproteranol, which is also what we use to provoke orthostatic intolerance on the tilt test. Many patients with orthostatic intolerance have autonomic dysfunction in the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract, so they can have uh, gastroesophageal reflux, abdominal pain, nausea, irritable bowel syndrome, and something called median arcuate ligament syndrome, where you get a lot of postprandial pain and can have weight loss. This is caused by compression of the celiac uh, artery and celiac ganglia. Food allergies are common. 31% of our chronic fatigue patients who have orthostatic intolerance have a uh, delayed reaction to milk protein. So it's not an, an anaphylactic allergy, but it's a very bothersome symptom. And unless we get rid of that, they still have orthostatic symptoms. There's been new interest in something called mast cell activation syndrome, which appears to be uh, uh, to represent a subset of those with orthostatic intolerance and is fairly common in those with EDS. Inhalant allergies are common. Infection can trigger the onset of orthostatic intolerance. We find that even in the hypermobile population that many patients have focal areas of tightness and movement restriction that a good physical therapist can identify. Thoracic outlet syndrome is common in our patients. Uh, they can have migraines and headaches. There's a subset with Chiari malformations, cervical spinal stenosis, craniocervical instability,
and they, so the patients with orthostatic intolerance need a very careful neurologic examination to hunt for that. Uh, we have even a few uh, young women who have something called ovarian varices or pelvic vein incompetence, sometimes called pelvic congestion syndrome, as another trigger. And the, the dilated pelvic veins can be a, a, a reservoir for excessive pooling of blood in the pelvis. When we move to pharmacologic therapy, uh, we are trying to deal with this using vasoconstrictor drugs, things that expand the blood volume, and then drugs that affect heart rate or the release of catecholamines. Among the more helpful ones in the vasoconstrictor category are midodrin and the stimulant medications. Uh, in, for volume expansion, we use a lot of uh, extra sodium in the diet and occasionally intravenously. Fludrocortisone can help with blood volume expansion, as can clonidine and desmopressin. And then to reduce heart rate, we often begin with beta blockers. Uh, Evabridine is a newer drug that can control heart rate, especially if the resting heart rate is above 100. And we've had a lot of success with pyridostigmine bromide in patients as well. So managing orthostatic intolerance requires a lot of attention by the patient and the practitioner. So this is, this is teamwork to identify the factors that provoke their symptoms. And it is rare that a, the first medication we try is going to be the most effective. You've got to be willing to try several medications before you find a good fit. And it in, involves making sure you're still looking for the other comorbid conditions if none of the usual medications are working. Uh, because there's usually some other reason why people are continuing to have problems. It requires a realization, much like we have in patients with asthma, that the medications can treat symptoms but don't necessarily cure the underlying problem. We're just trying to get people very functional. Management of the orthostatic intolerance is one part of a comprehensive program of care. So you've got to have people looking at all of these other problems that can influence orthostatic intolerance. In terms of resources, uh, a group of pediatric ME-CFS practitioners uh, shown on this slide put together a primer on the management of that condition, but in there is a lot of information on the medications and dosing for orthostatic intolerance. This was published in Frontiers in Pediatrics as an open access publication, so it's available to everyone. These are some references that will be in your slides of the papers that have discussed orthostatic intolerance in EDS, uh, starting with uh, at the bottom with the paper that uh, from our clinic that brought this to everyone's attention back in 1999 and including the very good papers by Inga de Vondelai, who's really done a fantastic job uh, extending these findings. Uh, and then a number of online references uh, are to the SOLVE ME CSF initiative. They have some webinars. Uh, the uh, Dysautonomia International does, and ob obviously the EDS Society. If you want more granular detail on managing orthostatic intolerance and dosing, you can look for a webinar I did for the MECFS initiative uh, back in 2010. And this is, uh, if you hunt on YouTube for managing orthostatic intolerance, you can find that. The caveat is that you have to put in Dr. Peter Rowe because if you just type in the name, you get the director of the Little Shop of Horrors movie. Uh, so uh, I, don't, uh, I don't claim to have any directoral skills. And then just uh, a final slide listing those who have helped us maintain the clinic over the last 25 years, uh, some grants from different groups, uh, the Sunshine Natural Wellbeing Foundation has endowed the chair that allows me to continue this work. We've had help from Colleen Marden, our research coordinator. We've had some fantastic summer students. And then much of the work that we've done has been funded by philanthropic contributions by uh, the folks seen on this slide and many, many others. So we're very grateful for that support. 